And welcome back, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us here on Tactics. Now, uh, one of the things that has happened for a long time here on the show is uh, whenever something big happens in the Supreme Court, we typically wind up getting this guy on here. He's uh, named Matt Clark. He's a buddy of mine, uh, somebody that's been a friend of the program many, many times. Uh, so without further ado, Matt Clark of the Foundation for Moral Law. Welcome on to the program, Matt. Good to be with you. Howdy, Caleb. Thanks for having me. It's good uh, being with you today, as always. Thanks for having me on. I got to say, man, you're making me look bad because normally when I have these, uh, ever since the uh, corona apocalypse set upon us, whenever I interview people, they're like at their home and sweats and everything. And so I look really good on screen compared to that. And you, you know, <laughs> dressed to the nines, putting me to shame over here. Well, thanks. I, I, I would have dressed uh, better if... Uh, I, I don't know. And I've been on the uh, on the show earlier today. This is uh, th this is kind of the outfit that you pull out when it technically satisfies uh, the the requirements for a lawyer, uh, but you're not really planning on being anywhere, and it's kind of uh, an easier day. Well, don't worry. I've already set the standard on dress real low, so we should be okay on that. <laughs> uh, so when it comes to the Supreme Court, and we do tend to have you on here only uh, when you know the, this stuff comes down, usually in the middle of the year, about the time of year that it is now, um, it's amazing to me that the other day when I was looking at this, I think that, that I and a lot of people around me, and I know that he tried to give like sort of an originalist paying homage to that idea, but with a six to three decision on this and with Neil Gorsuch of all people who for most conservatives and, and you and I talked about him when he was first appointed, uh, has been someone that has been seen as like the reincarnation of Anton and Scalia. I think that we were watching this and going, Okay, well, I don't think Anton and Scalia would have come to this conclusion when it comes to the case. So if you could give us a little background on the case and, and how Neil Gorsuch, of all people, wound up siding with Justice Roberts and the, the liberal justices. Sure. Um, well, you know, one of the last questions that you asked is something that I'm still trying to figure out, which is how in the world did you, Neil Gorsuch, come to this particular uh, conclusion? But, you know, the, this, but to, to the best extent I can explain it. So what, what happened in uh, these cases, it, it was actually a combination of uh, three cases, two of which involved um, people being fired, apparently just because they were gay. Uh, mm -hmm. And then another case arising out of Michigan, uh, there was a Christian funeral home owner um, who had been running uh, the family business for, for many years, running uh, several sets of funeral homes. And one day his funeral director, who was a man, uh, came to him and said, hey, I'm coming out as a woman, I'm transgender, so um, I want to start coming to work uh, according to the women's dress code and not the men. And, you know, the funeral homeowner said, all right, I'm sorry, I can't allow that. And uh, she was, I'm sorry, he was fired because of that. Now, all three of these people wound up bringing lawsuits under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which right. does not, despite Congress's many, many, many attempts to amend the statute, does not prohibit discrimination in the workplace on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. But what it does prohibit is discrimination on the basis of sex or because of sex. Um, you know, back in 1964, when this law was passed, what it really was trying to do was trying to eliminate sexism in the workplace and trying to give women an equal footing with men. That's all it was really designed to do. But uh, there, the, the theory that was pursued in this case, it, it's, it's relatively new. It, it only started arising around 2017 or so, was the argument was that whenever you discriminate against a transgender or homosexual person, you are necessarily uh, discriminating against them on the basis of sex because their, you know, their, their sexuality and their gender identity is, you know, inseparably bound up with their sex. So that's kind of how the argument went. Um, it, it was, it, you know, it struck me as pretty absurd and same thing with uh, Justices Alito, Thomas and Kavanaugh, because mm -hmm. in 1964, when this law was passed, um, homosexuality was criminalized uh, in 49 out of 50 states and the District of Columbia. Right. And gender identity was diagnosed by the DSM as a mental disorder. You know, that only changed recently as well. So, right. And I might add with no explanation, they just basically said, well, it's not anymore. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And we all know what's going on. They're, they're, they're caving to the politically correct crowd. Um, but 
you know, they didn't really give a reason explanation for why it's not a uh, mental disorder anymore. Uh, but anyway, the case came up to, all three cases wound up coming up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And, you know, my wife and I, and our senior counsel here at the foundation, John Eismo, we all filed a brief on behalf of the Christian, Christian funeral home owner uh, in amicus brief supporting him. And, you know, we tried to make the argument pretty plainly to the court that in 1964, nobody in their right mind thought that prohibiting um, uh, discrimination on the basis of sex applied in any way to homosexuality or to gender identity. Right. Um, and we also tried to bring up the religious freedom implications, you know, for instance, in this, in the case of the Christian funeral homeowner, like if you blow the door wide open to that, what about this guy's religious freedom? It's like, look, this is a, uh, is a small business, it's a family business under controlling cases like Hobby Lobby, um, you know, the free exercise clause and, and the religious freedom restoration act apply to me too. So, you know, I have the right to say no to this. And, uh, we tried to talk a lot about just, you know, all the problems that were going to come up if the court got this wrong. Well, uh, you know, I, I listened to oral argument. I was actually in D.C. at the Supreme Court. Alliance Defending Freedom invited us up, and right. I was able to take that up. And, and at oral argument, John Roberts and Neil Gorsuch were being pretty hard on the attorneys for the LGBT crowd and pretty light on you know, the attorneys for our side. But Gorsuch hmm. did ask one question. He, he, he didn't really press his theory hard in the oral argument. He just kind of threw the question out to the attorneys on our side asking, hey, maybe you can help me with this. Um, how would you respond to the argument that, uh, you know, discriminating against uh, a gay or transgender person is the same as uh, discriminating on the basis of sex? So at that point, some people started to get a little troubled because, uh, you know, Gorsuch has really tried to make himself out to be a very staunch textualist. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, he threw that question out there and it, it did get a lot of people thinking, maybe we have a problem with, uh, with, with Gorsuch. And it, it turned out that, that was quite right. Um, when, when, the, when the court took the case under advisement, it still seemed to me like Gorsuch was squarely in our corner and he was just trying to ask that question as an attempt to, you know, be fair to both sides sure. and, and ask both sides hard questions if he could. But Which is something a good justice should do, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and, and for instance, even uh, Justice Sotomayor, who's one of the more outspoken liberals on the court, she was grilling... Um, you know, the questions for uh, the, the she, she was grilling the attorney for the plaintiffs, you know, asking them, you know, all right, let's get down. What happens with things like shared bathrooms if you roll your way? You know, mm -hmm. don't, I'm not going to let you off the hook. Talk to me. What happens here? Right. But then she she had no problem going along with the majority opinion. So, um, yeah, the questions they ask at oral argument can be quite misleading. Right. Uh, but but anyways, um, yeah, Gorsuch, you know, he, he really when he wrote the majority opinion in this case, he really did, a, he, he tried to appear like he was following in Justice Scalia's footsteps. Um, you know, once he bought the principle that, you know, anytime that you discriminate on, you know, against a gay or transgender person, you are necessarily discriminating uh, on the basis of sex, it was all over for him. And so mm. he, he even pointed out, uh, he says, you know, there, there have been objections that nobody would have really thought about this application back then. But you know, trying to make himself out to be a textualist, somebody who is all about what the statute says as opposed to its purpose. Um, he said, look, if Congress has a problem with this law, they can go back and amend it. OK, but my job is to apply the law that's written. And in this case, that demands this particular outcome. Um, so, yeah, yeah. That, I, I have a hard time buying that argument for a couple of reasons. It, first of all, it seems it just reeks of, even though, like you said, it sort of is caked into the language that would tickle a conservative's ears, talking about originalism, textualism. It has all the trappings of a conservative idea, but at its core is folly, at least based on my understanding of it. And, and the reason I bring you on is because you understand these things more than I do. Uh, but it seems as though there's several reasons why that would be ridiculous because Gorsuch himself actually argues in this opinion that biological gender is a real thing. Mm -hmm. And so if he's acknowledging that biological gender is a real thing and acknowledging that there are differences between men and women, then discriminating against somebody, whether you think it's right or not, based upon their sexual preferences or sexual de desires 
would absolutely be appropriate when you consider that there are some actions that are appropriate for men and not for women as a basis of their biological gender. The first example that I thought of, and I, I want to kind of bounce this off of you, um, would we say that it would be inappropriate, for example, for, let's say, a construction company? Uh, they're outside in the sun all day. They're only around other employees of the company. They're not really, you know, around the public. Um, so, you know, they're kind of in an enclosed space. However, uh, a lot of the men that work for the construction company work shirtless because that's most comfortable for them. But the company has a policy that women cannot do the same thing because that would be indecent. Well, if you're following the logic of this decision, that would absolutely, because if they're saying that, uh, you know, if you're, if one action is not okay for a man, but okay for a woman or vice versa, then that would be a title seven, uh, violation. According mm -hmm. to this logic, that would be inappropriate. You know, th th that's a very good hypothetical. I think you're, I think you're definitely onto something. Um, we, uh, it, you know, actually last year, uh, th there was, you know, a case like that at the Supreme Court mm -hmm. that uh, we, we try to jump in on and, and push back against something like that. Uh, the, 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 there's a group of um, uh, feminists in New Hampshire that brought a suit saying that requiring women to wear tops but not men is a violation of the Equal Protection Clause. Um, and what it the, the New Hampshire Supreme Court only in a three to two decision, so it was very close, but they upheld the ordinance. And then they asked the Supreme Court to take it. So we actually filed a brief opposing it. Unfortunately, the court turned it down. But yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head is that, um, and, and the U.S. Supreme Court said this. I, it was in a 2001 decision, I believe. Um, I think the, the, the petitioner's name was Nugen, N-Y-U-G-E-N. I, I can't remember uh, the rest of the case name. But the, the court said, you know, principles like this, like the Equal Protection Clause and Title VII, they do not prohibit people from noting what are real differences between the sexes. Right. You know, they just, you know, they, they just don't, because if, you know, if we were to go that far, then we would really destroy the concept of sex entirely and engage in the fiction that, you know, the sexes are completely alike in every way. And it's just not true. Right. And this has been my big question about it, because what you're talking about is accurate. And, and what I was trying to stab at is that that would technically be a discrimination of an action or a choice in the case of either, uh, a man being attracted to other men and pursuing them romantically or in the, the hypothetical that I gave a man taking a shirt off where it's not appropriate for a woman to. Um, but what I think is, is the bigger uh, thing that I kind of wanted to um, dive into, which I think even contradicts other federal law. We're not even talking constitutional differences or, or sort of uh, larger, more grandiose moral differences. Uh, wouldn't this decision also kind of negate title nine? Because the whole point of Title IX is that you have to have equal opportunity for men and women, and you have separate leagues of male and female athletes. But, um, like, based on this decision, you could argue that allowing a man to play on a woman's team, but but not on a, or allowing a man to play on a man's team, but not play on a woman's team, would also be a violation. So now does title seven cancel out title nine? Like there's all kinds of unintended consequences that come from this decision. You know, I'm not sure who I'm talking to right now, whether it's Caleb Colquitt or justice Alito. Because, uh, <laughs> that is high praise. <laughs> no, you know, Alito said the exact same thing in his dissent. And I think both of you are spot on. I actually um, didn't read that. I'm surprised that we came to the same thing without me even <laughs> having heard that, but, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, Alito's dissent was fantastic. I mean, you know, number one, he, he pointed out that uh, th this was, you know, not what Justice Scalia would have done. He uh, he, he said, you know, the, the, the court's opinion flies under the flag of textualism, but it's really more like a pirate ship because it's flying under one flag, but it's actually, uh, you know, a, a, a philosophy of judicial interpretation that Justice Scalia would have abhorred. It's updating the statute according to your preferences. That's what right. he was doing. Um, but yeah, at, at the end though, he brought out the, the parade of horribles and he, you know, he, he brought up, you know, women's force specifically. I don't think he specifically mentioned title nine, but you know, the, the consequences are, are the same. Um, and, and that's going to be a big question. There, there are a lot of cases right now, um, around the country where, uh, transgender activists have been, um, suing under title nine, trying to abolish, uh, the differences between, um, between the sexes when it comes to things like, um, you know, locker rooms and bathrooms and showers and, you know, in, in public schools. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's terrifying because these are our kids that, you know, 
the left wants to subject to their social experiments that are very harmful and they're hijacking law in order to get there. Um, so while, at the end of the day, while uh, Monday's decision did not directly affect Title IX, it looks like the principle is probably going to apply in the same way unless clever lawyers can find a way to distinguish the two. So we're, we're on very uh, scary terrain right here. Yeah, certainly. And uh, actually, that kind of perfectly hedgeways into, because since we are talking about the law of unintended consequences, uh, this is something that I know is of great concern to you, uh, great concern to the foundation, and, and great concern to me and my audience, is uh, what kind of ramifications does this have for religious liberty? Because I have heard, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, there is some legal standing and precedent that would at least lead us to believe that there may be some exceptions for religious organizations that are overtly religious, like a church, for example, uh, under, even under Title VII and the understanding that we had before 48 hours ago when it was understood that on the basis of sex meant whether you're a man or a woman, that the, that the state could not obligate a church, for example, that believes that women preachers are not something that is biblically sound, it couldn't obligate them to hire a female preacher. Uh, and so there was a little bit of leeway given to overtly religious uh, organizations, but A, is that going to go away for actual churches and religious institutions? And B, um, does that, I guess there's probably a lesser protection there, but does that, would that also extend to somewhat secular religious organizations like a Catholic hospital, something like that? Yeah, the, the, those are those are fantastic questions. And I think um, that, that's really what's on everybody's mind right now, because on the one hand, it's, it's one thing to tolerate evil, you know, if, if, if uh, you know people are doing terrible things mm -hmm. and we hate it, we'd rather that they not do it. But then when they try to rope us into it, and you say, "I'm a Christian, I can't be part of this." Do you have, you know, any way to put a shield up and say, "Hey, even if y'all can, you know, get away with doing that, I get an exception because I'm religious." Uh, so I think I think the short answer is yes. Uh, the technical answer is it's an open question. Um, <laughs> it's. Because as you, as Monday's decision shows, you can never underestimate the ability of a court to look at a very plainly written statute with a very obvious meaning and completely butcher it if that's what they want to do. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yes. Uh, so churches and um, and religious entities that are not necessarily churches, I think they do have a few lines of defense remaining. And, and to Justice Gorsuch's credit, he pointed it out, and he seemed to be indicating that you know, he thought these laws should apply and get, you know, religious institutions out of it. Uh, he, he had to stop short of saying that, but he was giving very strong hints that he thought, all right, even if everybody else has to comply with this garbage, if you have a religious objection, uh, it's different. But um, one exception is called the ministerial exception. This is not based on a federal statute. It's based on the Constitution itself. And um, the, the Supreme Court recognized it in 2012. And, and what it essentially holds is that if the government comes along and tells a church or a religious organization that um, when they're choosing their ministers, they have to comply with you know some of these qualifications, then they're not only prohibiting the free exercise of religion for that church or religious organization, but they're also kind of establishing a religion as well because they're telling them how they have to do things. So it's one of those rare instances where right, it's basically co-opting doctrine. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So the Supreme Court has recognized that and said, all right, if you are a minister of your faith, then you're exempted from this. But here's the here's here's the tricky part. The question mm -hmm. then becomes, who is a minister? Um, and the Supreme Court has not really answered that yet. It's th th there's one case that should be coming out in the next couple of weeks in front of the Supreme Court that wrestles with that right now mm -hmm. um, involving uh, involving teachers at a Catholic school. Um, I, I think it's safe to presume if you are. Uh, on staff, say, you know, as a preacher, pastor, priest, you know, whatever your job is where, you know, it's your primary job to, you know, administer the sacraments, preach the word, things like that, you're probably safe. Um, right. it, it gets hairier when, if you're on staff and you're performing things that might not be as religious in nature, like if you're a janitor or a facilities manager or something like that, that's where it gets a little hairy. Uh, so here at the Foundation for Moral Law, we've actually jumped in on those cases and we've taken the position that you're, you're right to recognize a ministerial exception, but you need to defer to that organization's um, definition of what a minister is, because otherwise you're starting to tell, you know, 
these groups what their religion is or is not and you can't do that um so we're hoping the supreme court goes along with us but uh yeah that, that, that remains to be seen um there are also there's also the religious freedom restoration act uh which makes life a lot harder on the government when it tries to crack down on people uh, for not going along with a government mandate that violates their religious beliefs. So Justice Gorsuch, he indicated that that law, you know, if, if, um, uh, if it came into play, would probably supersede Title VII. It probably would, but it's still technically an open question. So right. there is some good news for uh, churches, religious organizations, um, and, uh, and, and, and people like that. Uh, but it's, it still remains to see how all this is going to play out. Okay. Well, uh, I kind of wanted to, because that gets into a lot of the, the federal law and, and a little bit in case law and, and just mm -hmm. understanding that, uh, I'd like to, for a second, and I know that this is an area that interests you as well, uh, broaden our scope a little bit and talk to what, what I was actually talking about Monday on my show, the bigger question, which is, and I don't know, uh, exactly how much of an opinion you can give on this. I'm not sure. Um, I think that what is being somewhat neglected in this discussion is talking about the greater underlying principles here, which is even the idea, if you go back to the understanding of a business is not allowed to discriminate based on the basis of sex or race or whatever else, that there is a question of religion, of uh, not religious freedom, but freedom of association and economic freedom when you tell a person that their property, which in this case is a business, you are not allowed to do with your property what you want. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that is a threshold issue. And because uh, people are um, too scared to go there, a lot of the times I don't think it gets discussed because... Um, right, because... And, and I don't mean to interrupt, but the first thing that people assume when you say that, and I know that because I've had the, these arrows thrown at me as well, uh, the first thing I'll say is, oh, so you just want to be able to fire black people. It's like, well, no, I don't want yeah. the black people fired, but I think that as horrible and bigoted as it would be for someone to do that, I think they've got the liberty to make that decision if it's their business. And I also have the, the freedom to never go there again, but, you know. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, I agree with you. Um, I, I agree with you on that. So, you know, not necessarily as, as a legal matter, but as a policy matter, I, I agree. I'm a big fan of guys like Milton Friedman and, uh, you know, people like that. Um, and, and, and so coming back to the threshold questions of, you know, should the government really be telling people what and what not to do with their business? I think the, the answer is um, it, it's, it's largely no, it shouldn't. Uh, and, you know, in, in today's, you know, today's culture, especially, um, I mean, look at what's going on around the country right now. There, there's a lot of outrage over, you know, the killings of, um, uh, you know, George Floyd and uh, Ahmed Aubrey and, and people like that. And rightfully so. I'm, I'm furious sure. about it, too. Um, yeah. But, you know, people are taking this to, you know, to, to such extremes that, look, if, if, if anybody nowadays fired, you know, somebody for being black, you know, not only would there be an economic boycott of it, which I would all be in favor for, by the way, sure. I would join that boycott for sure. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, with, with the culture being where it is, that, that, that place would not only be boycotted and uh, run out of business, would probably burn down as well, uh, which, you know, I'm not in favor of. But right, of course, today. but like, if nothing else, that uh, it does demonstrate that our society has moved past a place of just tolerating that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree completely. I mean, you know, if... You know, if, if somebody wants to be, you know, as stupid and bigoted as to fire, you know, somebody like that, you know, I, I think um, I think the free market would, uh, you know, run that business owner out of business faster than, you know, a government lawsuit could. <laughs> and sure. I'd, I'd be in favor of that for sure. Um, so but no, I, I agree. It, it does get to be a lot more problematic when, you know, the government keeps coming in and telling people, you know, what they have to do with, you know, with their business. Um, you know, you go back to the, the parable of um, the vineyard owner and, and, you know, at the end of the day, you know, everybody comes up to get paid and the owner, um, you know, gives the people that worked one hour the same wages as he did for uh, everybody who works the, the entire uh, the entire day. And the guys who work longer got mad. And, you know, the owner says, isn't it my right to do with my own what I wish. I haven't done you any wrong. We had an agreement. You had an agreement to work for this much. So take what's yours and go. You know, so in the same way here, I think it's 
Yeah. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, uh, for fans of the show, they'll know what I'm talking about when I say this. Uh, bringing that up in this contest uh, context just gave me a great idea for my next um, uh, j- social justice warrior Bible segment. I'm totally <laughs> yes. going to do that now. But yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Like, it's the person's to do with what they want. Nowadays, it feels like, especially in America, if that parable took place in real time here in America, that there would be a lawsuit filed. Yep. Yeah, you got that right for sure. Um, so, but, but but you're right. I mean, you, you have to you have to come back to things like you know uh, ec- you know economic liberty. I, I think the government has a um, you know has has a only a very minor role in in regulating that stuff. And and I, and I have to ask too. Um, you know, if stuff like this is gonna, uh, if stuff like this is gonna happen, I, I think it should be happening more at the state level than at the feds. Um, mm-hmm. the, I think the Fourteenth Amendment does give the the federal government jurisdiction to prohibit discriminatory practices at the, you know, within the state governments, um, because the Fourteenth Amendment, you know, says no state shall do, and then the, 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 there's a whole list of things that a state can't do. Right, but. It, it's it's a step beyond that to say that the federal government has jurisdiction over um uh you know o- over private commercial affairs uh it it, it doesn't so you know, i've looked at the case law here title seven when it comes to regulating private businesses its power is supposedly based on the commerce clause and as you know very well that that clause has probably been abused worse than any other provision in the constitution to expand the power of the federal government so um right it's become the magical legal MacGuffin that the left trots out whenever they want to do something yeah <laughs> yeah that's a good way to put it so i don't know it does everything no, yeah <laughs> but... yeah exactly you know i i have like you know, just because I, you know, I question the constitutionality of Title VII to begin with, doesn't mean that I'm going to hop on board uh, a constitutional challenge to take the whole thing down. I have no interest in doing that at all. Sure. But, um, but, uh, but, but, but we should be coming back to asking questions of, you know, as a threshold matter, should the government be coming in and, you know, telling businesses what they can and can't do? Because eventually, if you get to the point where you do it too much, you're going to crush them and you're going to kill them. You know, and and especially. Uh, in, in times where, you know, like where we are right now with the coronavirus sure. throwing one heck of a curveball at the economy, you, you don't need to be crippling with businesses with uh, lots of rules. You need to be able to set them free to do their thing. And if, if they do business well, then they'll they'll thrive because customers are going to come. Um, and if they're being stupid, like, you know, not hiring black people because they're black, they're going to go out of business very fast. Right. And one thing that I actually did want to uh, to bring up and, and sort of bounce off of you, uh, because I think that the average person and I, I know a little bit more about it. I'm not a lawyer or anything, but I know a little bit more about it just because I've studied this for a long time. Uh, I think the average person doesn't really understand the difference in textualism and originalism, because while they are very closely connected, they are not technically the same thing. And so, because I know that you're more eloquent in this kind of thing than I am, could you just give us sort of a brief understanding of that and also explain the differences with this particular case and why that matters? Sure. Um, So the, 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 the champion of terminology when it came to these two things was Antonin Scalia. And so a lot of the times when we debate it, we, we, we tend to look at it as, as Scalia would. So um, with that framework in mind, originalism tends to apply more to constitutional interpretation. And the question asks, you know, at, you know what was the original public meaning of uh, th- this part of the constitution that we're looking at? Um, the textualism is a little bit more narrow and it applies when you're looking at statutes and it tends to ask more, what does the text of the statute say? Mm -hmm. Now there's a reason that uh, there's a difference between these two. Sometimes, Um, you know, with, with constitutions, um, constitutions are not really written like a legal code that has, you know, a bunch of different code provisions that addresses uh, that that address specific situations. Uh, Constitutions are meant to address you know, the large general concepts. Um, right, and, unless and, you're in Alabama where it deals with literally everything. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, if the federal constitution was like the Alabama constitution, we, you know, then we, we, we would be uh, hopelessly lost when it comes to <laughs> understanding what our government can and can't do. Um, but, you know, be, because constitutions don't get as detailed as statutes, 
there's more room to look at what the original intent was. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, there's a lot more room to look at things like, okay, l l let's look at the debates in, uh, in the houses of Congress as they considered voting on this. Let's look at the debates in, um, in the state legislatures as they were ratifying this. Uh, the, because, you know, be, because it's more of a broad concept, you have more information that you have to consider. Textualism, according to Scalia, applies to statutes because, uh, you know, they're, they're more, you know, narrow in focus. And Scalia, one of his pet peeves, and honestly, I'm not 100% sure I agreed with him on this. And, and a lot of conservatives stopped short of going all in with Scalia. Sure. But he, he, one of his thoughts was when you're looking at a statute, you should not pull up the legislative history. You should not, like, if the records are available about the debates that took place, um, in the legislature, you really shouldn't open that up and, and dive into that. And, and I think part of the reason why Scalia and, and you know, even guys like Gorsuch um, had, have an allergy to this is because for a very long time, whenever liberal judges wanted to find a way to get around what a statute said, that's what they would do. They would go back to the, you know, the floor debates or you know, the House reports or you know, whatever else was used to pass this thing and say, all right, you know, here it is. And then they, they just get around the plain language of the statute by doing that. Um, they also brought up the points that, you know, that kind of stuff is not accessible to the average person, whereas a statute is, all right? So, you know, a statute is supposed to put a person of ordinary intelligence on notice of what's expected of them. Sometimes mm -hmm. because, you know, there, there are criminal sanctions that, or there, there are real consequences that come if you don't comply with them. So that's why textualism focuses on saying, all right, legislature, regardless of what you should have, what you were intending to do, at the end of the day, we're going to hold you responsible for what you put in that statute, right? If you mm -hmm. meant to include something else, but you failed to include it, well, then it's your fault for being a bad communicator, okay? Because what we're trying to look out for is the average people that don't know the backstory to this thing, but they're, they're trying to look at the statute and trying to figure out what's expected of them. Um, so anyway, that's, that's kind of the distinction between originalism and textualism. Well, you now, know, to, to a degree, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you, go, I think I know what you're going to ask. So oh, okay. Go well, I was going to say to a degree, I understand the distinction there and I understand at least some of the rationale because what you don't want to do is you don't want judges looking at law and speculating at, oh, this is probably what they meant. So this is how we'll interpret it because then you get the Obamacare decision with John Roberts. Uh, yes. You, the, 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 you, best this, example ever. Right, the, the you-know-what-we-meant clause in the Constitution, apparently. <laughs> um, but I, I understand the hesitancy to go, like, whole hog and just basically try to figure out and get inside the head of each and every person that voted for this law. I get that, A, you can drive yourself crazy, and B, that's bad judgment at that point. So I, I, get, the, I get the desire to stick strictly with the text of the law, but... The issue that I, I can see running into is exactly what happened here, which is if you just look at the sheer text and ignore what the average person would have understood it to mean, that the problem with that, and this is especially something that I have a little expertise in because I'm a communication major, language changes, words change, the connotation surrounding words change constantly. And so you run into some issues there because then you could have a law say literally the exact opposite of what was intended when it was written. And if we can just change laws by changing the language, then what's the point in recording law and writing it down and making sure that we have it for the future anyway? We have a way to update laws. It's just that's supposed to be done by the legislature, not nine unelected judges. You, you nailed it. Again, I highly recommend reading Alito's dissent because he, he's saying – pretty much exactly the same thing you're saying, except mm -hmm. in more legalese. Um, yeah, well, he's smarter than me. But... <laughs> well, yeah, he, uh, well, I don't know. It, lawyering is the process of taking a simple thing and making it complicated. <laughs> uh, whereas the job of a communicator is making, you know, complicated right. things and making it simple. So you're, you know, you're, you're absolutely nailing that. <laughs> um, uh, so, but, you know, and, and on that note, okay, so in fairness to Justice Gorsuch, um, there, there is a logic behind, you know, what he said. You can, if we're being intellectually honest about it, you can see how somebody might come to the conclusion that, all right, you know, I might not like it. It may seem like an absurd result, but I'm really going just with what the text says, and here's the implications. The problem is that Gorsuch's view of textualism was not nuanced enough. Um, Alito called him out on this and beat him over the head with it in the dissent. But 
know, Scalia said, look, text, and, and, and Kavanaugh did too, said, look, textualism and literalism are not the same thing. All right, you know, the court today, by, by taking this application of sex, is that nobody in their right minds would have thought of at the time mm -hmm. and, and, and making a drastic policy change. That's, you know, that, that's really more literalism than textualism. Textualism, at least according to Scalia, is re interpreting the statute according to the ordinary meaning that the words had at the time the statute was passed. Mm -hmm. So they, they made a big deal out of this. Like, we're not going with the literal meaning, we're going with the ordinary meaning um, that, you know, the average member of Congress would have considered uh, at the time the statute was passed. Um, and, 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 and that made that, that made one heck of a difference in how this, this case uh, shook out. So. Yeah, I will say to Kavanaugh's credit, and you and I were both very skeptical of Kavanaugh when he was uh, being considered, not because of any of the, the crap that came out about these ridiculous allegations of him being a gang rapist, but we were looking at his legal theory and going, uh, he's kind of an unknown quantity, so at, at least in certain areas of the law. And uh, so I got to give props to Kavanaugh, and he even said, I believe if this is not an exact quote, it's something very similar, a paraphrase here, uh, that basically he doesn't want people to just be fired because they're gay, but there's a right way to do it. Essentially saying, I'm a judge, I don't get to legislate, Congress has been doing this and, and been trying to pass this legislation, the Democrats have been trying to pass legislation that would essentially uh, broaden the meaning of Title VII to include homosexuals, trans, that sort of thing, and there's been some disagreement on that. Um, but, but Kavanaugh is basically saying, that's the right way to do it. I'm not going to do it through this. That, to me, shows a great deal of restraint. Yeah, I, I agree with you completely. And um, a lot of us were concerned uh, when uh, uh, Kavanaugh was being confirmed that he might be the type of judge to... Uh, you know, be a little bit more squishy, you know, maybe like Anthony Kennedy was and, and start, you know, doing this. Everybody thought that that Gorsuch would be able to completely separate the two, whereas in this case, it's exactly the other way around. Kavanaugh, mm -hmm. um, I mean, and, and frankly, I, I do not, I, I mean, he, he, he went beyond saying, um, uh, you know, I, I don't want, you know, gay people and transgender people to be fired. I mean, he, he really seemed to view it as more of a, a positive good. Like he didn't have a moral problem with it. That, that That's at least the sense I got from it. And to me, that was alarming. But to his sure. credit, at the end of the day, the question is, regardless of, you know, what your view is on this, what are you going to do? Are you going to go with what the law says or are you going to read, you know, uh, what you want into the statute? And at the end of the day, Gorsuch read what he wanted into the statute and Kavanaugh restrained himself. Um so right. I, I found that to be pretty incredible. Yeah, and along those same lines, and, and this goes back to a legal principle I, I literally just learned like uh, 24 hours ago watching Josh Hammer. Uh, but uh, this principle that really did resonate and make sense to me is that, uh, which kind of debunks the, the entire argument surrounding this, is that Congress tends to not hide elephants in mouse holes. And yeah. so sort of the idea here is that what Gorsuch was trying to read into this and Kavanaugh was saying, well, no, it's not reasonable to believe that, um, that uh, whether they intended to or not, and, and Gorsuch actually brings that up, that he doesn't believe that they intended this, but ruled this way anyway, which is still baffling to me, uh, mm -hmm. that they didn't intend for this to include that. And the idea that, that Congress is not going to intentionally hide gigantic sweeping legislation that completely changes the structure of how we understand law in one or two tiny words that you have to do a thousand different kinds of mental gymnastics to get to that conclusion. And so that was, that was kind of ignored by Gorsuch and embraced by Alito, Kavanaugh, and, and Thomas in this case. Yeah, you know... Um... Yeah, I think I think the elephants and mouse holes thing was another uh, uh, phrase Justice Scalia coined. And, uh, you know, in order to try to keep up the charade that he was following Scalia, Gorsuch actually brought that up. And he said, you know, all right, so let's get to the elephants and mouse holes canon of statutory interpretation. He says, all right, undoubtedly, you know, this is uh, this is an elephant because it's a big policy change. But then he go, but he responds to that. He says, but where's the mouse hole? He says, you know, discriminating against somebody based on sexual orientation or on gender identity necessarily includes, you know, discrimination based on sex. So it's like there's an elephant in there, but it's not hiding in a mouse hole. It's been staring at us the entire time and nobody saw it. And, you know, when you get to the point where you are arguing with a straight face that Congress intended or, or Congress at least reasonably should have been aware that 
they were intending to keep homosexuality criminalized in 49 out of 50 states, uh, transgenderism diagnosed as a mental disorder, but allow this stuff in the workplace? When you can argue that with a straight face, yeah, th- you've, you've missed a big point. <laughs> there are several reasons why that argument completely falls flat, and, and Gorsuch, which is, who is somebody that I admire usually for his logical takes on that, I don't see how you can buy that. I mean, today, the average person that hasn't studied history and doesn't realize that they weren't living in a world with 250 different genders maybe reasonably should assume, okay, well, Congress should have seen this coming, but they didn't live in that world. Uh, Basis of sex, you ask a thousand people and you'll get the same answer every single time back in 1964 that on the basis of sex means, oh, that means whether you're a man or a woman. Mm -hmm. Yep. You nailed it. And again, that that was, that was a central point that, uh, Alito to ra- Alito raised to, to tear down Gorsuch's argument. So I, I think I think you'll find uh, Alito's dissent, um, uh, you know, very likable when you read it because it, it's tracking with a lot of what you're saying right here. Well, uh, I, I do have a a great deal of admiration for Alito. So I, I don't know. Maybe I just wound up because we have similar legal theories reaching a lot of the same <laughs> conclusions. All right. Well, thank you so much for being with us, Matt. Uh, before we go, one real quick thing I wanted to ask you, is there anything coming down the pipe for the Supreme Court we need to keep an eye on? Yeah, there's there, there's a lot of stuff. So, um, you know, like I mentioned before, there, there, there are two cases involving, um, you know, whether Catholic schools who fired um, teachers are entitled to the ministerial exception. And that's that, that's going to be a, a case to watch out for. The um, the name of the case uh, is Our Lady of Guadalupe versus Morrissey Bureau, I think. The, two hard names to get down. Um, but anyway, that one should be coming out in the next couple of weeks. And that's going to be very telling of, um, you know, how that exception is going to apply when churches and uh, Christian schools and, and the like are going to be saying, hey, we don't want to go along with this LGBT stuff in the workplace because we got religious convictions against this. So that, that's going to be one to keep an eye out for. Um, another one that's going to be coming out soon is June Medical Services versus Guy. Um, that is the first abortion case that the Supreme Court agreed to hear since Justice Kavanaugh replaced Justice Kennedy. And I was very optimistic that um, we now have the five votes to, you know, finally overrule Roe and Casey. Uh, but after, you know, uh, Gorsuch and, and Roberts did what they did this weekend. Now I'm not, uh, now I'm not so sure. So now um, we'll, we'll have to wait and see, but you may remember that when we discussed that originally, I don't want to be the, I told you so kind of guy, but I, you remember, I was very skeptical of that observation and, and you were a lot more optimistic. I tell you what, I really hope that I'm wrong. And uh, if I am wrong, we'll definitely have to go and get a steak dinner to celebrate. But uh, <laughs> after this, like, I, I'm the same as you. I'm kind of looking at that as like, yeah, I don't think there's any way that they overturn Roe. Yeah, we're, we're, we're going to find out. Um, Gor- you know, Gorsuch in particular is uh, he, he's so much of an enigma to me because up until this point, he really has been Scalia 2.0. Um, mm. And, and, and so, I, you know, I, I was optimistic that he would be able to set his personal views aside instead of uh, combining them with what the law actually says. But uh, it looks like we were wrong. And, and, and Roberts as well. You know, a lot of people don't know this, but back when George H.W. Bush was uh, the, the president, uh, Roberts was the deputy solicitor general. So he argued a lot of cases, including in front of the Supreme Court. And in the one abortion case he got to argue, it was uh, Russ versus Sullivan, it was a 1990 case. Mm-hmm. Um, he led with uh, you know, telling the Supreme Court that Roe was wrongly decided and should be thrown out, even though the question before the court was, was something very, uh, it w- was, was much narrower. Uh, it, it involved whether you know, abortion services were entitled to public funds, and, and, and it was you know, even more narrow than that. But he led with saying, hey, by the way, you guys got this really wrong and why don't you just throw the whole thing out? Now, if you're not going to go there, um, I'll answer, you know, the more narrow question that you're considering. You know, but, you know, back then, I mean, Roberts, hardly from being, you know, a squishy, you know, uh, establishment Republican, he was a firebrand conservative and very pro-life and went out of his way to make the point that Roe should be thrown out completely. Um, I just don't know how the years on the court have, have changed him. I think right now, and and I could be wrong in my observation, but I don't think I am based on everything that I've read. I think that what's happened with Roberts is that Roberts has gotten so 
entrenched in the politics of it. And I don't even mean politics of left and right. I mean politics of he's far more concerned with how the court looks than he is whether or not they make correct or incorrect rulings. And that's the thing I, that I'm worried about. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, I, I have a theory on the on that that you know that that could be why he joined uh, Gorsuch's opinion. Um, I, I have a theory, and I can't prove it. That you know, when when the court took the case under the advisement, the initial vote was five to four, with Gorsuch joining the liberals uh, and, and being the swing vote. But under the Supreme Court's rules, um, whoever the most senior justice is. Um, you know, among the the majority gets to decide who writes the opinion. Right. So it would so, have been Ginsburg. Bingo. Yep. So it could be that Roberts switched sides and let Gorsuch write it in order to try to minimize the damage. I, I can't know for sure, but you know, it, it would fit with this theory of trying to make the court look good because you know Gorsuch for you know as badly as he screwed this up. Uh, you know, if it was one of the liberals that did this, I mean that. They, they, they would have had a, a far more sweeping and, you know, patently illegal opinion than what Gorsuch came out with. So, yeah. Can you imagine uh, a prevailing ob- opinion by Sotomayor? Eey. Oh, gosh. Yeah. God help us. Yeah. She's, she, she is more than anybody else. She is the flamethrower for the liberal block, you know. <laughs> um, so Right. A lot of people point to Ginsburg, and I understand that because she's been there longer. But to me, Sotomayor is by far the worst one. But yeah, I agree with you. Uh, all right. Well, I mean, it sounds like we've got quite a bit coming down that we'll have to keep an eye on. Uh, thanks so much for being here. Uh, if anybody does want to support the foundation or learn more about it, where would they go to do that? Uh, thanks for asking, Caleb. You can go to www.morallaw.org. Uh, that's our, that's our website. You can come check it out. Um, we have, you know, copies of a lot of the briefs that we filed, including the one that we filed in this case available on our website. And, uh, if you're uh, interested in, you know, donating, we have instructions on how to do it there too. So thank you. All right, Matt, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, we'll probably have you back on because like you said, there's a whole bunch of controversial stuff with the Supreme court coming down the pipe. So we'll see where that goes. Um, I got to tell you, this segment hasn't made me feel any better, but at least we did get the information out there. Thanks for being with us. No problem, Gil. All right. and And we'll be back in just a second on Tactics. Ever wonder where Superman gets his incredible powers? Some people say it's the yellow son of Earth, but I think it's because he subscribes to this channel and likes my videos. Now, I'm not saying that if you subscribe to my channel, you'll necessarily wake up tomorrow as a super strong, nearly invincible alien, but it definitely doesn't hurt your chances.